Welcome. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My name is Janice Thomas and I'm the Senior Director of Engagement for the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. Uh, you'll have to forgive me, I've got these silly glasses on and I can't really see very well, so I'm going to have to put my things up here. Uh, the Peter Doherty Auditorium, where we come together this evening, is on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. The Wurundjeri people have been the custodians of this area for thousands of years and continue to have a unique role in the life of this land. We pay our respects to their elders and families and welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who join us here tonight. Distinguished guests, colleagues, partners and students of the Melbourne Medical School, welcome to the third symposium organised by our Medical School Student ambas Ambassadors. I especially want to thank Professor Sharon Lewin for hosting us here tonight at the Doherty Institute for Affection and Immunity. Thank you, Sharon. Retranslate aims to bring together alumni, staff and students our hospital and institute partners and members of the faculty to celebrate research achievements and share advances in knowledge and practice. Tonight we are filming and live streaming the symposium so that students, staff and alumni, wherever they are based, can be part of this conversation and I offer a special welcome to everyone who is joining us remotely. Our speakers tonight are at the forefront of antimicrobial resistance knowledge globally. They are giving significantly of their time and we are pleased to be able to share their knowledge broadly and thank them very much for doing so. The presentations and discussions from this, this symposium will be available as a learning resource for current and future students and for members of our community who want to better understand the important health challenge of antimicrobial resistance. I thank our student ambassadors for making all of this possible and I seriously thank them from the bottom of my heart because they're all absolutely wonderful and don't anyone leave tonight without speaking to at least one of them. The Medical School Student Ambassador Program began during the 150th anniversary celebrations of the Melbourne Medical School in 2012. What our ambassadors have achieved in that time in terms of supporting their peers, supporting <coughs> medical education and bringing the broader medical community together has been truly inspiring. Well done. They have organised symposia like this one. They run events to support networking and career building for students, past and present, and they raise funds for a bursary to support their peers in need of emergency funds. The head of the Melbourne Medical School, Professor Jeff McColl, could not be here with us tonight. He's not very well, but he did want to acknowledge this initiative of the Melbourne School Ambassador Program and thank them for organising this wonderful event. Leading the organising team for the symposium this year is Nicholas Saputro, an MD3 student based at our Western Clinical School, and please join me in welcoming Nicholas as our MC tonight. Good evening and welcome to Retranslate. I'd like to make a special welcome to my peers at clinical schools in Ballarat, Bendigo, Wangaratta and Shepparton. My name is Nicholas Soputro and I am one of the student ambassadors of the Melbourne Medical School. Since the program's inception in the 150th anniversary of the Melbourne Medical School, the student ambassadors have had the privilege to represent our school and faculty and tooling alumni students and communities as we strive to promote health and medical education. We are also privileged to be the group of students responsible for the conception of wonderful initiatives such as Retranslate and the Medical Student Relief Bursary. Retranslate Symposia in Translational Science aim to explore how groundbreaking research in different fields of medicine are translated into clinical practice we are excited this year to talk about antimicrobial resistance and to come together at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, which is a partnership between the University of Melbourne and the Royal Melbourne Hospital and a leading centre for infection and immunity related research. The symposium today brings to us five researchers working at the forefront of our battle against antimicrobial researchers and against antimicrobial resistance. 
At the end of their presentations, there will be a panel discussion and we'll in invite questions from the audience here in the theater and online. The panel will be chaired by Professor Christian Kilpatrick, Chief Executive of Melbourne Health. This event would be possible without the generous contributions of our speakers, the ongoing support from the engagement unit of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences, and the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity. In particular, the blessing from its inaugural director, Professor Sharon Lewin. It is my pleasure now to introduce to you Professor Sharon Lewin to welcome you to the Institute and provide an overview of the challenges of antimicrobial resistance. Leading infectious diseases expert, Professor Sharon Lewin is a professor of medicine at the University of Melbourne and a National Health and Medical Research Council practitioner fellow. As an infectious diseases physician and basic scientist, her laboratory focuses on research aimed at finding a cure for HIV and understanding the interaction between HIV and hepatitis B virus. Her laboratory is funded by the NHMRC, the National Institutes of Health, the Wellcome Trust, the American Foundations for AIDS Research, and multiple commercial partnerships. She has authored over 230 publications and given over 100 major international invited talks. She is the chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee for Bloodborne Viruses and Sexually Transmitted Infections, the PIC Advisory Committee for the Federal Minister for Health, a member of the NHMRC Council, an elected member of the Governing Council of the, of the International Aid Society representing the Asia Pacific region, and was a Foundation Council member of the Australian Academy for Health and Medical Research. She was named Melbourneian of the Year in 2014, and in 2015 was awarded the Peter Wills Medal by Research Australia. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Sharon Lewin to introduce the topic of antimicrobial resistance. Thank you very much, Nick, for the really lovely uh, introduction and congratulations to you and all your colleagues on uh, organising this event. Personally, I find medical students a bit scary nowadays because they're so incredibly accomplished and slick in what they do. And uh, I really am so very impressed that you've been able to pull this off the third of um, your retranslate uh, symposia. So very, very warm welcome uh, to the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity. I know the audience is largely medical students and alumni, and um, I'll start by confession, I'm not an alumnus of Melbourne University. I went through Monash University, but most alumni that come to this precinct now say how incredibly different it is. And I hope that for those that haven't been here for a while, you get a, a taste of that. Uh, we are certainly one of the new additions uh, to the precinct, and I hope one that will have um, a very lasting legacy for many, many generations of medical students, doctors and researchers that train here. So we're a new institute. Uh, we're only three years old. In fact, our birthday, our third birthday is next week, but we are a joint venture of the University of Melbourne, as you've heard, and the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and bring together some very established researchers that have been working in the field of infection and immunity uh, for decades. We have over about 700 scientists, educators, clinicians, and public health experts working here. So it really is a truly multidisciplinary uh, Institute, which I think is the only way we'll ever be able to tackle and solve major health problems. Um, the building actually was uh, from an investment of over $210 million. And for those of you that have never been here before, hopefully you can come back and potentially have a tour because the place is truly amazing, given our facilities to handle particularly um, highly infectious pathogens at what, level three or level four. For those that aren't familiar with that, level four is where you wear spacesuits to handle infectious material. And the funding came from the state government, Commonwealth government and the university. And as I mentioned, um, opened in September 2014. And our overall vision is to improve health globally through discovery, uh, prevention and cure, through discovery research actually, prevention and cure of infectious diseases. 
You've heard we're a joint venture, and that means that we've got lots of clinician scientists um, in our institute. And for those um, that are thinking about what career, especially medical students, you might want to take uh, in the future, I can highly recommend um, being a clinician scientist. It really is an absolute privilege. And in fact, you're going to hear pretty much from our four <sighs> clinician scientists who work here, people that see patients um, and have the great uh, pleasure and privilege of doing that and making a difference in people's lives, but also being able to research and make a big difference at a totally different level by discovering new things and making using their research to inform policy, to inform new discoveries, new drugs, new vaccines, um, new ways of preventing or just doing business because we need to constantly innovate. What we learnt as medical students 30 odd years ago should not be the medicine that we continue to practise now. And this is pretty much um, how I've spent my career as a clinician science, scientist in the worlds of both research and clinical care, largely um, in HIV and more recently since I've moved here, um, really an intense interest in so many other areas of infectious diseases. Um, my husband actually um, still wishes I went and took up a far more lucrative area of medicine and still often says to me, is it too late to do interventional radiology, but um, I, think, I think that's sort of over. I keep on telling him. Plus, there's absolutely no way I'd want to be an interventional radiologist. And I hope there are no budding interventional radiologists in the room, but you will do very well financially. So um, I, I'm really excited about uh, the people that we have um, speaking to you tonight. Uh, um, all of them are, as I mentioned, working both in the clinical and, and research areas. And you'll hear a little bit more about what they've done but, and what they think we should be doing in this very challenging time of antimicrobial resistance. And of course, I started, when I, I like giving my, when I talk to medical students, I like saying that when I started medicine in 1981, um, HIV was unheard of and I spent my entire career um, in that area. And what could potentially happen to your careers as medical students and how the future is totally unknown of where you might go. And I think we all trained in an era where, um, you know, antibiotics were just accepted as something that you had at your fingertips for any particular um, infection. But of course, we're seeing that the situation um, is changing uh, very, very rapidly. And I think many of the clinicians in the room will, will all have had an experience of managing someone with a serious infection where you might have had a choice of one or maybe two antibiotics and in some cases really no um, antibiotics. And the fear is that this is going to potentially um, increase it as we go forward. Um, and there are really uh, so many different aspects of antimicrobial resistance to think about. And although I'm a scientist and I like some technical solutions to things like a new drug or a vaccine, I'm not sure that is going to be the solution for antimicrobial resistance. It's so much more complex than that, like many of the big challenges we have in health, because it's about beha human behaviour, about over-prescribing um, antibiotics, inappropriate prescribing, not just in human health, which is an area that we think we know, we do know well and have some ways of regulating and controlling, but it's more than human health, it's animal health. Um, there is uh, uh, issues around um, uh, travel, around migration, the world being a much smaller place than ever before, so that whatever is happening on antimicrobial prescribing in India is real, or in Papua New Guinea or uh, Brazil is actually relevant to what we do here in Australia. We have to think about um, far better, uh, this is one area where I think we might have a, a technical solution is the issues about diagnostics and epidemiology of tracking antimicrobial resistance. We, we'll hear, I'm sure, about this from Ben. We've got these incredible tools now of using genomics to look at the genetic code of a bacteria to understand it, how it's related to other bacteria. This could make a really big difference, but of course, a very expensive solution. We need better computer systems that link data across Australia. Um, there's lots of issues about how we share this sort of data within between hospitals, between states, between countries, and we need far better technical solutions for that. And people talk a lot about the drug, the you know, private sector and the role that drug companies need to play here, um, and there is very little commercial incentive for drug companies to develop new drugs, but I'm not sure that that is really the major issue that 
we need to address to tackle antimicrobial resistance. I think what you'll hear tonight is that no one actually owns antimicrobial resistance. This is an area that many, many different disciplines need to be involved with. Behavioural scientists, psychologists, policy makers, people that are experts in genomics and prescribing, um, a whole lot of different disciplines are actually needed. And that I think the Australian government is becoming very, very interested in this problem. Some of you might know that in 2015, um, we, Australia, the Australian government released its first um, antimicrobial resistance strategy. And especially the students in the room, that may not sound like a big deal, but not every disease in it, or not every health issue in Australia has a strategy. This is a sign that the government takes this seriously. It often comes with increased funding, but you need a strategy first before you can make any financial investment. So it's a very important signal that the government thinks this is important. And of course, the whole world thinks this is important. The WHO recently announced that AMR is probably one of the biggest issues in infection, infectious diseases that, are, that is facing the world globally. And the UN General Assembly actually held a special meeting on antimicrobial resistance um, just in 2016. And um, again, people can be a bit cynical about what the UN can achieve, but the UN actually has only held similar you know, general assembly meetings on four, th three other times in the area of health. And that was in um, non-communicable diseases, um, Ebola and HIV. And actually when they held the uh, general assembly meeting on HIV, which was last year, I had the opportunity to go and represent Australia. And it was really truly extraordinary to see how decisions are made across so, in, a, in an area like HIV, but I'm sure with AMR the same, how it's, it, it, this has such different levels of priority for so many different countries and how some level of consensus that is achieved. Again, a um, very political statement, but really, really important, particularly in getting countries that may not think this is terribly important to potentially cooperate with other countries. So we're um, very, very interested in antimicrobial resistance at the Doherty. We have a huge number of people that are truly expert in the area. And it is actually one of our um, key major themes, which are just summarised here, which are, of course, immunology, um, uh, given uh, the fabulous immunologists we have here, and, of course, the legacy of Peter Doherty, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in 1996 for the major discovery work he did in T-cell immunology, viral infectious diseases, um, particularly HIV, hepatitis, flu and emerging infections are incredibly important to us as our host pathogen interactions. But um, healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial resistance is a, is a major theme and an area that I think we have a lot to contribute given the spectrum of disciplines we cover, which you're going to hear about. In addition, we're really thrilled that um, Cheryl Jones has joined us uh, from Sydney. Um, she actually is an alumnus of uh, Melbourne University, so she, she's come back home. She's now the Professor of Paediatrics at the Royal Children's Hospital, an infectious disease physician, and um, the head of the Australasian Society of Infectious Diseases. So it's just wonderful that Cheryl has joined and uh, we hope will be doing a lot with us um, in antimicrobial resistance going forward. So again, um, congratulations to our ambassadors. An absolute pleasure for us to hope, host Retranslate in such an important area. A pleasure for all of the alumni to see what's happened um, in this precinct and learn a little bit about the work that we do here. So thank you again. I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lewin. Um, Professor Jody McVernon is a medical graduate with subspecialty training in pediatrics, public health, and vaccinology. She has extensive expertise in clinical vaccine trials, epidemiology studies, and mathematical mo modeling of infectious diseases gained at the University of Oxford, Health Protection Agency London, and the University of Melbourne. She is director of epidemiology at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity. She's a national health and Medical Research Council um, Principal Research Fellow and leads an NHMRC-funded nationally distributed center of research excellence in policy-relevant re infectious disease simulation and mathematical modeling. 
Her research group uses mathematical and compute computational models to advance understanding of infectious disease ep epidemiology and consider the likely impacts of interventions to limit infection spread and burden. Please welcome Professor Jody McVernon. Thank you very much for that introduction and the invitation to present, and I promise there won't be any equations on my slides. <laughs> All right, so I've been asked to talk on the epidemiology and public health perspective relevant to AMR. And as you've heard from Sharon, this is perceived as a global health issue, the threat that in the future we may not have access to the antibiotics needed to treat serious infectious diseases. And in giving this framing, I'm going to start just with a little bit of um, domain definition um, of, of what we're talking about as epidemiologists and in public health. So the World Health Organization defines epidemiology as the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states or events, including disease, and then the application of that study to the control of diseases and other health problems. So we're really interested in why diseases happen, but there might be many things that lead to disease that don't actually relate to the clinical presentation or the bedside, but go a long way back in social determinants or environmental determinants of health. Similarly, I'm talking from the public health perspective, and, and Sharon's alluded to this, but I, I uh, reflected that as a medical student, uh, we were taught a, a nice example of the way the public health and near patient perspectives differ in relation to disease management. So while my children might think I actually went to medical school in the era on the left, I didn't. Uh, by the time I went to medical school, we were well aware of the risks of lung cancer associated with smoking from the British Doctors Cohort Study. But um, at the near patient perspective, I can look at my patient who smokes and say, well, you know, 17% of smokers will get lung cancer over the course of their lifetime, so your chances are pretty good that you won't die of lung cancer if you continue with this relaxing and health beneficial habit. But from a population perspective, we know that 86% of all lung cancers are associated with smoking. And so from the population perspective, the most effective way to reduce lung cancer is to aim for smoking cessation. And so similarly, when we're talking about a public health framing of a problem like antimicrobial resistance, we step back from the near patient and the decision making that occurs there and consider the overall strategy of our policy for antimicrobial use on a much longer time scale, on a much broader time scale that thinks about preserving the benefits of those agents for future generations. So this is my epidemiology and public health lens. Don't go away telling you I told you to smoke. All right, so stepping right back then, as a modeler and being interested in the determinants and drivers of health-related states, AMR is actually an ecosystem problem. So humans happen to be in the middle of a, of a much wider ecosystem that involves all other animals and the environment in which we live. And I just have a nice figure here from a paper by Mark Woolhouse, who's a, a modeler very active in this area of resistance, showing the, the, the cycle, if you like, of uh, antimicrobial resistance emergence and transmission and dissemination. So it's important to remember that microbes are not sentient beings. They don't think about what to do. They don't decide to become resistant. But as microbes multiply and they have many more generations than us, they develop mutations, they acquire mobile elements that may provide them with resistance. Sometimes those elements might make them less fit, less able to live, less able to transmit, but not necessarily. But when we then bathe the microbial population in antimicrobials, the ones that can survive those drugs will have a benefit and will be more likely to multiply than the ones that can be killed. And so antimicrobial usage uh, is certainly the driver and the selector for those resistant organisms. And as indicated in the figure here, we prescribe antimicrobials to humans, we prescribe them to agricultural and domestic uh, companion animals. Uh, through both of those means, we may eat food that's been contaminated with antimicrobials, uh, both humans and animals excrete, and that uh, excreta enters the environment where, again, resistant organisms can be picked up by other species. Uh, they can spread through the environment. And in fact, the antimicrobials themselves can be excreted and spread in the environment where they might, by their contact, select resistant organisms. So we have this very complex interconnected web. Uh, and understanding exactly what is driving what and what influences predominate in those mechanisms is, is very challenging to understand. And on the right, there's a, a, a tree, a phylogenetic tree, um, looking at antimicrobial resistance in isolates obtained from humans 
and from livestock. And if we take the, the tip on the far right, uh, the tips of that tree, those that are in that sort of reddish brownish colour are isolates that have been obtained from humans. In the blue, those from livestock. And if you trace those branches of the tree back to their roots, you'll see that here we, we kind of have a, a divergent point here where these are the organisms that are predominantly found in humans. These are the organisms that are predominantly found in livestock. But you'll note that here we have one of these strains appearing in livestock. So we have here a cross-species transfer of, a, of an organism from a human into an animal. But on this bottom side here where we have all of these livestock strains, many more crossover events occurring into humans. So from this particular data set, one would infer that the transfer of rate resistance from animals to humans is more common than in the op opposite direction. One of the challenges here is how much do we need to sample, how much information do we really have to be able to reliably infer that, that direction of relationship. <clears throat> in our region, um, clearly we aren't just thinking about agriculture in Australia where we actually have very good controls on prescribing, but in many countries in our region, the use of antibiotics in feed and growth promoters and so on is much more widespread and less regulated. And I've just you know, done my Google search to, to put up a, a little... Um, Smorgasbord really of images here. Here's a veterinary pharmacy in China and in one particular facility, these are the antibiotics that are being used on the farm in, in the corner of one room. These are sort of, you know, the kind of media images that are, that are very common. I couldn't help but put pig progress, gateway to the world of pig production, which I thought we all should rush home and read as a fascinating, uh, a fascinating publication. But, you know, particularly with um, this level of antimicrobial use, certainly in poultry in many countries, um, that antibiotics are used as feed promoters. Colistin is a very frequent ingredient in many of these. Um, and particularly with the merging of different agricultural systems with swine and, and poultry and, and seafood raised in close proximity, antimicrobial and, and microbial resistant contamination of seafood uh, from many parts of the world is very high. So, we are interconnected through our food supply, um, but we're very pleased that in Australia, our Australian Veterinary Association uh, has, been, um, has put antimicrobial resistance and stewardship as one of its five strategic priorities at the present time. And this particular release is just one with Animal Medicines Australia. They've been developing a, a series of prescribing guidelines for this one for livestock and horses to help improve stewardship in the animal health sector. I had to put this picture in. You know, the ecologists always have the best pictures. Um, but this particular science news story is actually relating to a, a paper in biology letters. What it raises is the fact that we are aware that we do prescribe antibiotics to agricultural and near companion animals, but those antibiotics, those resistant organisms can then disseminate through environmental sources, through birds and other mobile um, wildlife and, and are actually found quite commonly in, in much more uh, distant wildlife than we might consider. So even there, though, the mechanisms are hard to define. So elephant seals, microbial resistant organisms have been found in elephant seals more commonly uh, in regions that are closer to more densely populated uh, regions than what those with less human habitation. Uh, iguanas in the Galapagos are more likely to carry resistant organisms if they're in tourist destinations than in less tourist destinations. But we don't know exactly how that transfer is occurring. And in this particular figure, this is one study that was conducted on farms in the UK in dairy uh, properties. And the top here, we have six different dairy farms sampled. On the y-axis here is the percent prevalence of resistant E. coli identified from animals sampled on the property. In the red are cattle, in the black, rodents, in the grey, other mammals, so these are often companion, companion animals, uh, and in the yellow, wild birds. And we see across these uh, farms very high levels of resistance, up to 100% uh, on this particular farm in, uh, in other mammals. And my theory here, there are very few rodent uh, strains here. I think this is a very effective cat uh, that's killed off perhaps all of the rodents on the property, but um, we certainly do see uh, spreading to wild birds, and clearly they travel long distances, and so the potential for environmental dissemination is high. If we look at the actual antimicrobials, MDR here refers to E. coli that are resistant to at least three antibiotics, but we see quite high levels of resistance, up to 70% here to tetracycline among cattle and, and uh, other mammals on this particular farm. 
One of the challenging things, though, is that even though we see the same antibiotic resistance profiles, they're not necessarily in the same organisms or in closely related organisms. So it might be that mobile elements that confer resistance are swapping between bacteria, or that it's actually antimicrobials in the environment that are selecting for resistant organisms in those other uh, species. But trying to understand these causal mechanisms and their relationships is obviously important to be able to work out where we fit into this complex ecosystem. It's not all just about farms and animals. We all have a responsibility to reduce uh, antimicrobial resistance selection. This is um, some information from the Victorian Department of Health website on uh, avoiding the use of triclosan and other antimicrobial cleaning products. The good old soap and water and detergent do just as good a job, even though the advertising industry love to tell us that our houses are covered in teeming, swarming germs, uh, all underneath the toilet rim and all over the floors, which our children are ready to ingest. It's probably good for them. And of course, humans are mobile. So when we're thinking at that population level, we've talked about mobility of food, we've talked about motility of wildlife, but um, humans move and they are very effective um, acquirers and transporters of antimicrobial resistance. This is one study from the Netherlands published this year. It followed 2,000 tourists. 80% of people were travelling just socially uh, for holiday. Of the 1,800 who were negative for microbial resistant organisms before departure, uh, a third had acquired resistant organisms on their return. And of those people, while the median carriage of the resistant organism was a month, 10% were still carrying them at one year. And it was estimated that more than 10% transmitted those resistant organisms to another member of their household who hadn't travelled. Clearly, the site of travel was very important in where these um, organisms came from, on the likelihood that, that an antimicrobial resistant organism would be acquired and highest in South Asia. Um, and the types of activities that were associated were obviously taking antibiotics overseas, um, having diarrhoea, and particularly persistent diarrhoea, and eating street food did appear to have a dose-dependent relationship. Going to the beach was protective. So plan your next holiday carefully and choose a beach destination. So how do we deal with this? Well, clearly this One Health problem needs a One Health response. The latest term coined here is planetary health. How do we think about the fact that we are part of an interconnected system? There have been many documents released on this. I've put up one um, from the Australian Academy of Science, Theo Murphy's think tank last year. This particular session in the interdisciplinary approach to a risky world on AMR was chaired by Deb Williamson from the Doherty. And there were four main conclusions that, that were made from this in terms of research that was needed. There was a need to facilitate targeted interdisciplinary research. Uh, there was a greater need to understand and evaluate the impact of these environmental reservoirs on resistance transmission. Uh, a need to integrate socio-cultural and behavioural research. And you'll hear more about the behaviours uh, associated with prescribing, but how we need to have a really nuanced approach to those. And another recommendation was to incorporate antimicrobial use in food labelling, which is becoming one of those cachet value things that some meat producers are already putting on their, on their products. Um, global action plans, the Australian action plan, all recognise the importance of a One Health approach and a combined uh, cooperation between the World Health Organisation, the Animal Health Organisation and the Food and Agricultural Organisation of the United Nations. And these groups come with very different perspectives and, um, and agendas really in this area, but recognise the importance of this as a global uh, connected problem. I'm going to stop there, but thank you for your attention. <coughs> Thank you, Professor McVernon. Um, our next speaker is Professor Benjamin Howden. Professor Howden is the director of the Microbiological Diagnostic Unit Public Health Laboratory and the medical director of Doherty Applied Microbial Genomics in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Melbourne within Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity. He is also an infectious disease physician at Austin Health in Melbourne. As director of MDU PHL, Professor Howden oversees state and national public health microbiology service activities. His research interests have been driven by working in the hospital system and more recently in public health, where antibiotic resistant pathogens are major problems. His current research activities include the application of genomics to understand the emergence, spread, and pathogenesis of antimicrobial resistance bacterial pathogens understanding the mechanisms and impacts of antimicrobial resistance, 
microbial adaptations, and changes in host pathogen interactions during persistent Staphylococcus aureus infection, and exploring the role of genomics in public health and clinical microbiology. Please welcome Professor Benjamin Howden. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to this very interesting session. So mine is a technology-driven talk. It's about genomics, so a new technology that we're using uh, in many aspects of medicine. And if you're a medical student now and you're wanting to understand the future using genomics, whether it be in infectious diseases, microbiology, cancer, uh, is, is a critical part of what you need to learn about, really. Uh, why am I talking about genomics? So I, I'm a director of a public health laboratory, and this is the what we used to do in public health, we would, would get our samples or our clinical isolates referred to us. We'd do a whole range of different uh, tests in the laboratory to determine the serotype or the phage type or some other type of um, uh, characteristic of the pathogen. And then we'd write a report to government and they would decide how to act on that. And this has all been swept away in many, as in many respects by this new technology of whole genome sequencing or microbial genomics, which you can see on the right hand side there. And these are some of the fantastic new technologies that have been really come out of the, the drive of the Human uh, Genome Project, which really advanced the technology of sequencing genomes uh, at large scale. And because we work on bacteria and uh, viruses and other things that with very small genomes, we can, we can cash in on those new technologies to really uh, sequence things at very high throughput and start to use them in our day-to-day -day practice. And so that's what we're doing now. And we haven't completely transitioned away from the old technology but we're partway through that process. And this is happening on a global scale in public health microbiology. So what is genomics and why is it exciting? So if you're interested in microbiology, you'll be dealing with a pathogen such as, this might be a Staph aureus looking pathogen up here. If you extract the DNA from that pathogen, put it through a genome sequencing machine, such as one of these Illumina machines you see here, what you end up with is a whole raft of um, sequence reads, which are ACTs and Gs, all sort of stuck together in short uh, reads of 100 or 150 bases all connected together. And so that's complex data to try and understand. And so what we have is a black box of bioinformatics, which I'll get to in a minute. But this is the bit of, you know, the, the technology of deciphering those sequence reads. And so this is where the magic happens. And out of that, if we have the sequence of, of a whole bacterial genome, for example, we can find out many interesting things about that bacteria. We can, detail, we can tell whether it's resistant to antibiotics by looking for well-known antibiotic resistance genes, such as MEK-A that encodes methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. We can look for single mutations that might be linked to rifampicin resistance in TB, and we know what those mutations are, so we can easily interrogate the data for that. And then the other exciting thing we can do is start to compare uh, across genes. I'm very happy to see Jody, the epidemiologist, present a phylogenetic tree in her, her um, talk, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the key things you can do at very high resolution is compare um, uh, microbes to each other and see how related they are. And then a few other things you can do, which is a bit more on the, um, uh, the research end of the scale, is understand the virulence characteristics and also how these pathogens are evolving. So you might, you might talk about spread, but you might also talk about evolution. So how quickly are they evolving? What genes are they acquiring or losing? What, what mutations uh, do they acquire as they evolve? And this can inform an understanding of these pathogens. So why is it so exciting? Well, like if you go to the right-hand side first, this is what we used to do. You know, we would get, we would type our our samples, and they would all look pretty similar, and would say, okay, they're they're possibly related to each other, and this is our report. And as we've moved through the years or the decades, we've started to have slightly higher resolution technologies where we can actually uh, pinpoint which groups of um, microbes fit together and how they might relate to each other, which helps understand our public health problems. But now we're talking about resolution at the minute scale. So for an E. coli or a salmonella, there's 5 million bases, 5 million A's, T's, C's and G's in that bacterial genome. And we can tell if one of them is different, so one out of 5 million. And so that's the sort of resolution we can get to with genomics. And what, are we, what can we apply it to? Well, lots of different things which I've listed there, but particularly antimicrobial resistance. And I'll talk a bit more about how we do that. So defining what the resistance mechanisms are, how they're being spread, and also how the, the bacterial species that house this resistance, how they're moving between patients in the environment or directly between patients. So this is not my slide. This is from one of the bioinformaticians that works with us, but it explains 
phylogenetics. Okay, so for people who know, this is a very Australian slide actually, but for people who understand uh, chocolate bars, you can see that you know what we're talking about here is this uh, vertical distance here between the different chocolate bars tells you about how closely related or distantly related these chocolate bars are. And you can see ones that have the honeycomb are very close to each other. You only have to go this little distance here to find they're the same. And the banana is clearly the outlier from all of the others. So, <laughs> so that's phylogenetics in one slide from Torsten, who's one of the key bioinformaticians who works here at the Doherty. And why is that exciting? This is an example of, of from Listeria, which is not a drug-resistant pathogen. So we've never seen drug resistance in Listeria. But we do do national surveillance for Listeria in my laboratory using genomics now. And it's the first um, pathogen that we've used to do national surveillance for a public health pathogen in Australia. And the reason, this is just a, a single case example of why it's so exciting. So we had a, a case of Listeria in an elderly person from another state of Victoria that was unexplained. So none of the typing that we did showed what the source of the Listeria was. And it's usually, usually a foodborne pathogen and public health units get very worried about it because it can cause um, fetal death in utero and severe disease in elderly patients and neonates. But what we've been doing is uploading our genomic data, which is you know, globally, the, the language is the same with genomics, so there's no um, local differences in the way we do this, uh, to international databases that monitor listeria on a global scale. And so we uploaded our sequences, and then we got a call from the FDA, that's the Food and Drug Administration in the US, saying, oh, did you realise your new case you've uploaded is identical to Californian stone fruit listeria sequences from the USA? Went, oh, really? You know, what does that mean? But then we went back with the epidemiologist and tracked back to that case and actually found in their food history they'd been eating imported stone fruit from California, but no one had put the two together because they didn't realise that the stone fruit was contaminated with listeria. And so it's a fantastic example of the utility of the technology and how you can share information on not just a hospital, state, national, but a global scale to, to enhance our understanding of diseases and how they spread. So what do we need to do to start doing genomics? It's not straightforward. There's a lot of technology. We need robots in the laboratory that can extract DNA and make the, the libraries, they're called, that we put onto the genome sequences. And the absolute key is that, you know, the people who work on the black box bit, which is where the magic happens, as I said. And so what happens in there, I'm, I'm definitely not going to go through this, but it's about looking at the quality of the data. Was the sequencing good? Is it contaminated with any other bacteria? Uh, when we look at them, do, does it start to map together nicely? And then we start to do things like looking at the typing of the strain, what the sequence type is, what resistance genes it has, whether it's the right species that we thought we sequenced. And putting these things together, you can then also look at the, the relationship between all of the other genomes from that species we have in the database. And this is what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis now. So how do you apply this to antimicrobial resistance? So this is just one example, but it can be applied in many different ways, uh, either on a research or a, a um, service infection control sort of um, level. So there are many different types of antimicrobial resistance, but probably the most concerning nowadays is uh, carbapenem um, resistant enterobacteriaceae. When I was going through medical school, it was all about MRSA, which many of you will have heard about, VRE, they were the, the key ones in Australia. But in the last three to four years, uh, CPE, so carbapenem producing, uh, carbapenemase producing enterobacteriaceae have really taken over as a key global health threat. And what was happening in Victoria was that we were starting to see a lot of cases of what's called KPC, Klebsiella pneumoniae, appearing in Victoria. And these had never been reported in Australia before, other than one or two imported cases in people who travelled overseas. And so this was concerning, uh, obviously from a lab point of view, as we receive all of these isolates for confirmation. And so how do we investigate this? Well, we did a little bit of pseudo-epidemiology that we do if you're a microbiology lab, which is to try and look at the postcodes or the, the labs that sent in these isolates. And you actually you can see that they came from around the state and also from many different labs in Melbourne. So that was concerning. It didn't look like this was one laboratory that had sent all of these isolates in and it was a, an outbreak in one um, particular area. So that made it even more concerning. And then we thought about, OK, how are we going to compare these isolates to see if we have a local problem or if we just have lots of people traveling and bringing these things back from overseas because there's been lots of descriptions of these KPC isolates in uh, parts of um, Asia but particularly also in Greece and Israel and parts of the US. If you look at the antibiogram, so whenever you send a, an isolate to the lab you'll get an antibiotic, antibiotic resistance profile and this is what it is. It's all red which is bad predominantly 
but actually you can see it doesn't help trying to differentiate the isolates. You know, there's a little bit of a mix and match of some different profiles here. They all look pretty bad, but there's, you couldn't really say whether they're the same clone or not. And so what we did was sequence the genomes of the isolates, and this is the phylogenetic tree that we were talking about before. And they look reasonably similar, but how do we know that? Well, we go down to the scale here. So remember I said there's about 5 million bases in a, in a Klebsiella uh, genome. You can see that this scale here, this distance here, represents 20 differences over those 5 million. And so these ones here are all very closely related to each other. There's not many differences at all. And if you, with, you know, with the eye of faith, you can sort of see that there appear to be four different clusters uh, in, this, in this tree. So what do we have? We had lots of isolates from Victoria from many different uh, laboratories in the state, many of which look very similar to each other. So that was concerning enough to the, the uh, health department to go and start to investigate this. And what do you have to do to validate your genomics data? You have to collect good epidemiological data. So the genomics can infer a relationship, but then you have to go out and do good quality, uh, real world epidemiology. And this, you know, this is the hard work of epidemiologists going and collecting the admission data for these patients over the last five years to all the hospitals in Victoria. And it's color coded by hospital of admission. And what you can see here is that these two main clusters here have all been in hospital brown at one point, and many of them have overlapped. And so that's very good um, epidemiological validation of those clusters, actually. And you can see that this distinct cluster up here had all been in a different hospital and a different hospital network. And so what the epidemiology did was validate this, these four discrete clusters, show that B and C were actually probably part of the same hospital network, and the other two were separate. So that's, it shows we've got local transmission, it identifies the likely origins of this transmission and that we have more than uh, one site where this is occurring. And the other thing you can do is then drill down even further. So this is the top, if you go back to this top cluster here where the isolates look almost identical, this is one hospital. You can see that these three patients were all in the hospital at the same time. They're, they're very drug resistant isolate was all found around the same time. But actually there was another patient who was in that same ward but the, uh, the drug resistant bacteria wasn't identified in that patient and ultimately it became clear that was because they weren't screened properly. They moved to another hospital which, where they found the, the isolate and it then spread to a se another patient in that second hospital. And this just allows you to drill down to that point where you can say, okay, this is where the infection control practices broke down to allow this bacteria to spread to another institution, which is really important for working out the guidelines that you need to put in place to control the spread of these pathogens. And the other thing you can do, which um, I think was alluded to earlier, is start to model the genomic data a bit more. And this is called Bayesian modeling, where you can start to date, based on the, the isolate dates and uh, using Bayesian models, you can start to date when these isolates might have uh, first appeared or when the most recent common ancestor of these isolates appeared. Because one of the questions was, is this a single importation into Victoria, which has now evolved into four um, different clusters of spread, or are they different importations? And we know that the first documented case of KPC in Victoria was around 2010. And actually the two main clusters, if you look at the, uh, the error bars here, are around that sort of time period. But for the other two, the most recent common ancestor, although the error is very high, is much earlier. And so it's likely that these represent separate importations into the state which have then spread and evolved. And so I guess, the, the, you know, if you're talking about translation, the good translational outcome of this is that the the State Health Department's now really interested in this concept of using genomics at a forensic level to understand why we have these pathogens, why they're spreading. And so we now have statewide guidelines, which are in their second version, where every isolate of CPE is referred to the State Public Health Laboratory for genome sequencing and interpretation, combined with uh, epidemiological uh, data collection on those patients. And this combined analysis leads to actions to prevent further spread of these pathogens. So that's all I was going to say, but I will acknowledge that there's a lot of people who are working on this within uh, the Institute here, and many of them are named here, uh, particularly Courtney, who's the epidemiologist who does all of the, the um, epi data for CPE control in Victoria, and then the bioinformaticians, particularly Mark, who does the uh, data analysis. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Howden. Our next speaker is Professor Karen Thursky. 
Professor Thursky is the Deputy Head of Infectious Diseases at the Peter McCallum Cancer Center, Director of the NHMRC National Center for Antimicrobial Stewardship. She is the Director of the Guidance Group at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and, Immun and Immunity, and Principal Fellow in the Department of Medicine at the University of Melbourne and the Sir Peter McCallum Department of Oncology. As, infectious disease physician, as an inf infectious disease physician, Karen is a leader in the design and implementation of antimicrobial stewardship programs with particular expertise in the use of computerized systems to support better antibiotic prescribing and to monitor the appropriateness and safety of antibiotic use. Her multidisciplinary team of clinician and health service researchers is working to establish and implement antimicrobial stewardship programs across animal and human health sectors. Please welcome Professor Karen Thursky. Thank you. Um, thank you to Nicholas and his team. And I also have to plead that I'm also a Monash graduate, but as you can hear from all my affiliations, I'm well and truly entrenched in Melbourne <laughs> University. So I'm going to bring it back to the patient and bring it back and bring it back to the community and talk a little bit about what we're trying to do. So the N, we call it NCAS, fondly NCAS. Um, we're uh, situated, we're a multi-collaboration with um, various groups within the Doherty, within, with the veterinary um, faculty at, the, at Melbourne University, Monash University, <laughs> Clinical Excellence Commission um, and the Quality Safety Commission up in um, Sydney. We're a very big group as you can see and we are working across a One Health platform now. So we've had a fantastic time establishing over the past couple of years now programs within tertiary hospitals, rural regional hospitals, trying to understand models of care, aged care, general practice. Um, we have a couple of our veterinary stream here um, and we're um, uh, starting to work in the livestock stream and really we have a cross-platform PhD program all our fellows work across with each other. So we have nursing PhDs, pharmacist PhDs and doctor PhDs that are working across together to learn about health services research. Um, we have a, already have a senior a major policy role with their national AMR strategy. And NCAS is actually has, it, I think at the last count, about 30 objectives against the implementation stream. We are a partner with the National Surveillance Program with our NAPS data, and we are expert advisors to the Commission AMS Advisory Committee. And we have a number of activities um, outside of our research um, stream, including development of the antimicrobial anti prescribing survey tools. We have guidance implemented in around 70 hospitals, which has often meant working with the hospitals themselves to establish their AMS program. And we provide a major education and mentorship role, not only across Australia, but also with our regional partners. And we are um, already working with particularly Wipro to look at readiness assessment and implementation of stewardship programs in our region. And I have some photos uh, to focus there. This is our veterinary team who have recently put together and published the first ever non-pharma um, antibiotic guidelines for companion animals. So antimicrobial stewardship cannot be translated in, in any other language. It is a constant battle for us to explain exactly what it is and maybe we've shot ourselves in the foot by calling it antimicrobial stewardship. But it truly does um, have to bridge patient safety, which is our driver and how we sell it best, and we also have to bridge public health. So the judicious use of antibiotics will ultimately prevent or help limit the emergence of resistance. And it may or may not, but that's our goal. And ultimately, it is about cost-effective healthcare. And everything we do in this space, needs to, we need to consider how it's going to drive policy and best practice. And that is our drive with healthcare research. And so if we consider the situation that we have a limited number of antibodies that we can actually use these days, and the blue arrows after the name of the antibiotic, <laughs> is the time it takes for resistance to develop after the antibiotic has been reduced. You can see that those arrows have become shorter and shorter and shorter as we, as we move into the future. And equally, as we have seen that already with our newest antibiotics. And so this is why we think this judicious use really is a key driver when we know that the pipeline for new antibiotics is relatively short. 
And for those of you who are clinically practicing, and the medical students may, not, may or may not have seen it, but we've had terrible problems with drug shortages in Australia this year and internationally, where we've had to really think hard about what do we advise hospitals to use when there is a fluoxacillin shortage, a vancomycin shortage, a PIPTAS shortage, all at the same time. And this is the future that we're facing. When we think about antimicrobial stewardship, of course it's a program, a systems approach that we like to take, but I guess it's worthwhile thinking about what that actually means. And so we tend to divide the interventions in, into those that are restrictive, such as pre-prescription um, approval, and, and our program guidance is a specific example of that, so that in your hospital you'd have a limited formulary, you'd have drugs with particular indications. Um, we have most hospitals in Australia have endorsed the so-called traffic light system where we have narrow spectrum antibiotics like penicillins being um, easily available versus um, amber drugs like piperacillin, tazobactam, keptriaxone um, where the doctors need to get an approval to use and then the red drugs. These are the drugs which should be restricted and only prescribed by experts, drugs like tigacycline and daptomycin. There are also some hospitals who don't do pre-restriction, but they might require that there is some sort of approval to continue the drug. Uh, and then we move into the persuasive phase. Now, this persuasive approach is really probably the most important and the most effective. So all these um, electronic medical management systems, heavily used in the states, for example, where they've used frontline rules, um, decision support, um, triggers, order sets, will always um, improve the quality of the actual script and may improve compliance to guide, guidelines for what happens after then. And it's the same in our hospitals that are paper-based. You write the initial prescription and then what happens next? If we come from a premise where we know that the knowledge base of our residents, junior residents, our pharmacists, even our senior doctors, have major knowledge gaps inappropriate prescribing, you can imagine the burden of what our AMS teams face when we know that in many hospitals the appropriateness of our prescribing probably runs between 50 to 70 per cent. And so what we're starting to do now is to endorse the approach where we have post-prescription review, generally by antimicrobial teams, usually by pharmacists who've had some training in the area, uh, microbiologists, infectious diseases physician. We actually see patients, we actually see the, review the patient's prescription and discuss with the treating team about the best approach. It's very effective and allows that academic detail at the same time, but it's very time consuming. And Cheryl will talk about this in her talk, but we know that there is major underfunding for the type of workforce required to do this um, at, at a more system, systematic level. And then finally, it's around how do we feed back to the executives in the hospital and to the units, what are they doing? And if we're talking about the hospitals, we're well in front. We've got, we've got it sort of down pat, we just don't have the, enough resources. But if we're talking about aged care, general practice, veterinary, um, it is a completely different kettle of fish and they're a decade behind. So we're starting to build those systems approaches to stewardship, which we've had that time um, to develop. Now, there have been a number of systematic reviews and meta-analyses and lots of studies to show that stewardship does um, shorten length of stay, reduce cost of, risk, cost of antimicrobials, even improve patient mortality. But this is the first meta-analysis just published this month, which has now demonstrated that if you have a stewardship program in place, together with infection control measures, that you are able to impact the emergence and colonisation of multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacteria, um, ESBLs, MRSAs and C. diff. Um, and as I tweeted this week, you know, how much, more, how much more evidence do we need to convince our policymakers that stewardship programs need to be funded? Now, interestingly, VRE, Australia is actually the capital of the world of VRE, and this meta-analysis showed that stewardship programs perhaps was not one of the measures that could um, uh, reduce the incidence. 
Now, in Australia, we are one of the few countries in the world where we actually have a specific um, accreditation criteria for stewardship. It's been in place since 2013, so all hospitals in Australia have gone at least through, got, gone through at least one cycle. And it was fairly, um, many hospitals could, could pass the accreditation if they had a stewardship committee, they had a policy and procedure, that the staff had access to therapeutic guidelines, and that there was some measurement of usage. The updated version coming next year is much more granular and it's much more detailed. And the accreditors understand what they're now looking for in a well-run stewardship program. And there will be an expectation that there are those pre-restriction or the restrictive and persuasive elements of a stewardship program. It includes the clinical care standard, which I'll cover in a sec. They will look to see how hospitals can comply, comply with the policies. They will look to see how appropriate prescribing is. And for our, from our point of view as stewards, this has been a major driver to improve prescribing in hospitals. Um, accreditation for stewardship is being looked at in the aged care setting now. It has been looked at in general practice. Um, and this is only happening really this year for the first time. Now, the clinical care stand was developed with both hospital and general practitioners. And it is a set of minimum standards that apply to the prescriber rather than the hospital. It is a minimum set of acti actions that a prescriber should undertake when they're prescribing an antibiotic to a patient. It's also about safety, so that if a patient has sepsis or meningitis, they're going to get the antimicrobial quickly, but also that they explain to the patient why they have given them the antibiotic, what are the potential side effects and adverse effects, how they need to take the antibiotic, and that they are looking at um, um, micro results that should be taken before the antimicrobial is um, given. It's very interesting. We haven't looked at how this has been taken up. It hasn't been measured or evaluated. It's another element of the type of um, auditing and work that we will be expected to do as antimicrobial stewards. Um, but it is an interesting, interesting next step. So beyond the, just the hospital accreditation, we're coming down to looking at the individual prescriber as well. Now, the media is taking interest now. We um, are, are very conscious of the fact that stewardship, we don't really want to completely link to the term superbugs because we think it's more important about patient safety. But certainly, this was a headline in Sydney where the orthopaedic the, a report was leaked um, to the press about um, recalcitrant orthopaedic surgeons not getting approvals. Now, we, we know how hard it is to, for doctors to get approvals, but it means that I think there's a more general awareness in the, in the community about what the minimum standards patients should be expecting when they go to hospital to have their surgery. So I thought it's worthwhile having a reali reality check about the history of AMS in Australia, because we really were kind of at the forefront of developing that system approach. And uh, in the early 2000s, in fact, some of our, us here at uh, the Royal Melbourne Hospital had developed guidance, which triggered the interests of the ch um, Chief Executive Officer of the Commission at the time, Chris Bagley, who later went on to become the Chief Medical Officer and who was a great supporter of the AMR strategy. Um, we had already had the South Australian antimicrobial usage um, surveillance program in place. Um, Chris was interested to know well, what the next step should be. And so we talked about having a commission working party, which was set up within the Australian Commission. This was formed from representative of each of the states and typically with microbiologists, ID physicians and pharmacists who were expert in this field at the time. And we published the Australian Stewardship Book, um, which was very well received and is largely seen as a textbook of stewardship and used all over the world. And at the moment, it's being revised and will be released some chapters this year and some chapters next year. Um, and this time, we have included chapters on animal stewardship and the roles of uh, emerging roles of the nurse, the nurse indigenous stewardship. Um, community and aged care. So it's going to be an important piece of work. As I mentioned, we got the stewardship criteria in 2013. 
And the other big piece of work that we did was to develop the national platform for prescribing. And it's really the only system um, internationally where we, we hone in on appropriateness of prescribing. It's one thing measuring against compliance if you have guidelines, but often there aren't guidelines for complex patients. But you still can look at the appropriateness of the prescription in terms of the antimicrobial choice, dose or duration. And we've used this to help drive the targets for where we need, where we need to be going. So this is the 2016 National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey, which shows that we're starting to see engagement of the private sector, which is very important, um, because the private sector is where a lot of our elective surgery is being taken up. And, and these, many of these private hospitals are becoming quite complex environments, are more like big public hospitals. And if we just look at some of the data very simply, to look at the top five antimicrobials, we can see kefazolin, keftriaxone, um, piptaz, amoxiclav and metronidazole. Kefazolin's not that surprising when you look at the top indication for antimicrobial use in a hospital system being surgical prophylaxis. But also you see communicable pneumonia, medical prophylaxis, which is a very broad term, um, and particularly we don't have the data to dive deep, but we are updating our definitions list, which will allow us in future to dive deep into exactly what that means, but we know it's very much driven in the, in the cancer population. Urinary tract infections and sepsis. So these are the big five drivers of use in our hospital. Now when we look at appropriateness, it's even more interesting. Um, this year we have uh, a 2016 survey, we had over 25,000 prescriptions across Australia from major right down to remote, very remote hospitals, six bed hospitals, who are now contributing the data and using it with their own, within their own institution to implement their programs. It's been a very important tool for these sites which previously had, didn't have a standardised way of auditing their prescribing. And we can see in Australia our public hospitals are sitting around about 75% and in the private hospitals a lot lower. And I put in the very remote there because we know that this is a target for what we need. We know that remote regional um, hospitals do not have easy access to infectious diseases expertise. They do not have access to clinical pharmacists. And the GPs who are servicing those remote regional do need support. And we need to develop the programs like telehealth um, stewardship, where we're starting to do some work in Shepparton, and where we provide remote stewardship program support. Um, and this is a key target for our group. And what about aged care? We have well over a quarter of a million of the population um, in aged care facilities now. And the aged care um, survey was a very um, interesting and and an amazing amount of work from our aged care team and Nolene Bennett in particular and from Vicness here to develop this program. Um, and it was willingly, um, the uptake has been incredible because the nursing staff in those aged care homes finally had something that they could use and felt like they were contributing to something important. And the results from the 2016 are fairly shocking. So the prevalence of antibiotic use is around 7%. In our hospitals, it's 40, so it's not that. However, one in five of the patients on antibiotics were on Kefalex. And so for the medical students in the audience, can I just plead, plead with you to not use Kefalex and for Kef for everything, OK? Try not to, it's not, it's not a pill for everything. One third of the prescriptions where the patients had no signs or symptoms of infection and one half of the prescriptions had no review or stop date. And most shocking of all was that one quarter of the prescriptions extended for over six months. What is happening to these patients in these aged care homes when urinary, and, uh, urinary infection is treated and then repeat after repeat urinary prophylaxis? So when we think about aged care, I think we need to think carefully about what it is that we can do. Uh, there is an MRFF call, of course, in this area right now. And we need to think about the fact that aged care facilities generally have, a, have nursing staff on site. They don't have less than half will have any quality use of medicine support. Um, they are, the patients are often difficult to diagnose with regards to infection. 
We know that the nurses play a major role as coordinators of their care from our qualitative work, but they don't know what to do and they operate from a culture of fear for not doing the right thing for that patient. And we know that the GPs often come in and out. They're often locum GPs. They're often paper records. They don't really know what's happening with the patient from visit to visit. And also the carers are not there often to help um, with decision making, particularly when it comes to end of life with advanced care planning. And we have a, a PhD fellow who's specifically focusing on this particular issue about what to do about antimicrobials at the end of life and general practice. So I think we unfortunately have become internationally famous for our antimicrobial use in general practice. And this report that came out um, a couple of years ago shockingly showed that almost one half of the Australian population had at least one prescription of antibiotics and that a quarter of those were a broad spectrum and that there was a continued increasing use of um, systemic antibiotics. And we know that there are some programs in place like the Choosing Wisely program and education through MPS, but why, why is antimicrobial not going down? And why are the countries in Scandinavia, for example, so much better than we are? So we're not exactly sure, but we know that there are significant prescribing behaviours, there are no current AMS standards, there are structural issues about actually getting good quality data. So in our GP prescribing systems, they don't have to enter an indication. And in fact, the prompt for the indication, it only comes up after you've chosen the antibiotic anyway. The indication is not mandatory. There are default for repeat prescriptions, and prescriptions themselves are often not filled then, but filled a lot later. And so here we have this compounding problem of not having great data to understand what's going on and not really knowing what interventions we need to put some structural interventions in place and drivers and, and work with this prescribing issue. And we're currently doing a project right now with the Department of Health developing a NAPS program in GPs. This is some data from one of our PhD fellows, Leslie Halls, who's working with the Department of Monash, where she had access to over four mil or six million prescriptions from um, the um, Monash East, uh, Melbourne Inner East GP practice with the magnet software. And you can see that we have very high rates of continuous prescribing of kefalexin, which was used for everything, urine, chest, skin infections. And we have these seasonal peaks of other antibiotics, including um, augmentin, resithromycin, doxycycline, fluorithromycin. So immediately you can see here are some targets for how we can approach general practice in a practical way to perhaps improve prescribing. And so we consider the issue here, that compared to the Europeans where the use of benzoyl penicillin and, 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 and amoxicillin are quite standard. In fact, they would be quite shocked to be given anything else. In Australia, there's a clear pref preference for kefalexin um, and for broad spectrum drugs such as amoxicillin clavulinate over simply amoxicillin. And then the other clear target there is prescribing for upper respiratory tract infections, generally which are viruses. And so, again, you know that these are great targets. You would have seen that from the MPS um, um, programs. So finishing up um, this for all your medical students, I'm not sure whether this looks familiar to you, but this is a, this is a classic picture of medical hierarchy. Here we have God <laughs> at the patient bedside and I reckon he might be the medical student, registrar, nursing staff, and he will proclaim that this is the antibiotic that's going to be given. And, you know, well, well I, I, at, my, at my stage as a medical student, I'm not sure that I would have said, well, actually, sir, you shouldn't really be using keftriaxone because that's, you know. but anyway. So I thought for any of you who need some very, very good bedside reading, um, this is um, our Professor Alex Broom from University of New South Wales, actually here at the Doherty with me today, and his sister Jennifer Broom, who's an ID physician, who've published a series of brilliant work around the qualitative aspects of antimicrobial prescribing and really hone in on the issues that we think are the social determinants of prescribing that may not ever be fixed by accreditation or by restriction or persuasive. And it really comes down to the fear, 
the desire for autonomy, the type of rituals and performances, professional etiquette, and all these things that cause that surgeon to give Keftrax and a metronidazole to everyone. So I'm going to leave you with a, a transcript from that paper. Participant six, there are other practices that we do intraoperatively. We would, pet, we would put betadine in the wound, whether or not we should do or not do, but we all do it because it's just part of the culture. Pete, person five, superstition. Pete, person six, superstition, yeah, it's called the betadine blessing. The betadine blessing is where you put betadine over your bowel and anastomosis in an attempt to allow it to heal better. Then another consultant of mine does gentamicin powder in his wounds. He closes up the wound that is mesh in it, so inguinal hernia repair for the example, and he would literally open up a gentamicin bottle and put it into the wound and then he'll close it up. It's gentamicin fairy dust. Again, he says he's had no wound infections at all, no complications at all. He would sprinkle his fairy dust and never had a wound infection ever, ever. Never had one person come back in. Now, this might shock you, but we have surgeons in our own institutions that are sprinkling flucloxacillin fairy dust into their neurosurgery right now, and we have no idea how we're going to actually change their behaviour. And so I'll finish now just with an acknowledgement of all the team working. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thursky. Our final speaker is Professor Cheryl Jones. Professor Cheryl Jones is the president of the Australia, Australasian Society for Infectious Diseases, or SID. She is the Stevenson Chair of Pediatrics and Department Head at the University of Melbourne. Professor Cheryl Jones is an infectious disease physician at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne and an internationally recognised research leader in childhood infectious diseases with the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and the Maria Bashir Institute for Infectious Disease. Professor Cheryl Jones leads and co-leads multiple clinical infectious diseases groups across Australia and has earned over $25 million in peer-reviewed funding. She has led the ASID's Advocacy for Action Against Antimicrobial Resistance. Please welcome Professor Cheryl Jones. So I have to just uh, make one technical clarification. I'm actually not a Melbourne University graduate. In fact, I did my first four years of a six-year degree here, but followed my heart into state, as one does when you're young and foolish. <laughs> Nevertheless, after many years, I went via uh, to Sydney, to Boston, to Sydney, and now I'm back in wonderful Melbourne and at this amazing precinct. And it's a privilege to be here at the Doherty, at the wonderful Melbourne Children's Campus and part of the University of Melbourne. So I am a clinician researcher, but in fact, my research is not in antimicrobial resistance. It's actually in emerging infectious diseases of the brain. So why am I here tonight? And that is in my role as president of ACID. And what I've learned, and this is particularly for the medical students, is sometimes you have to step out of your comfort zone to advocate when you see some very important issues that you need to take action on. And I believe that antimicrobial resistance is actually one of those issues. It's been said by Professor Same da uh, Dame Sally Davies, who's the Chief Executive Officer of UK Health, that AMR, or antimicrobial resistance, is the single most important <coughs> public health issue of this time. Back in 2011, ACID, the, um, the Australasian Society for Infectious Diseases, held a summit with government and other key stakeholders to ask the question, what are things that we can do to tackle AMR? And those areas you've heard covered tonight include research and innovation, surveillance, infection pr prevention, and antimicrobial stewardship. However, what drove me to become an advocate is we're still in 2017 talking about these things. We have wonderful documents with strategies. We now have a national strategic plan. We have an implementation plan. But what we need are clear targets with actions that we can measure and timelines. And so the question I was, or the topic I was asked to discuss tonight, well, what are the health system and hospital challenges to tackling AMR? And I see there are four key challenges. 
The first of which is that the consequences of antimicrobial resistance may be now understood by government and expert groups, but they're underappreciated beyond expert groups, particularly within our hospitals and within our community and our, um, our patients. Secondly, as you've heard throughout all of our speakers, AMR is a complex topic and there are multiple drivers to AMR. Thirdly, Australia and our health system is very complex as well, and that makes implementation of strategies to tackle AMR quite tricky. And fourthly, and most importantly, I believe, is that we still haven't, uh, have not got the governance of our response to AMR correct, both in the detection and the response. You'd heard earlier from Sharon Lewin that AMR is now realised to be an important economic and health issue. Professor Jim Bishop in the UK last year released a report where he estimated that failure to address antibiotic resistance could result in uh, over 10 million deaths, uh, both in the UK and in uh, Europe and the USA by 2050, and cost uh, both those governments and societies over $66 trillion. And this has led to international responses, both from the G20 and the United Nations and the Australian government. Dame Sally Davies has talked about this apocalypse, or antibiotic apocalypse, if we don't respond to AMR now. But what does that really mean? How will our advances in healthcare change? Simple surgery may become uh, no longer possible. Safe obstetric care may be no longer possible. Intensive care, transplantation, chemotherapy for malignancy, immunosuppression and newborn care may not be possible. Earlier this year, we wrote a lead editorial for the Medical Journal of Australia about death from an untreatable infection from a woman in the United States who died from a highly resistant gram-negative organism, Klebsiella. She'd acquired that organism while travelling in India returned uh, with a bone and joint infection, returned to America and that infection spread throughout her body and even the most last line of our antibiotic armamentarium, colistin, was no longer effective and she died from overwhelming sepsis. And when the media said, are you making this an alarmist statement, is this the only case? I believe not. There are many cases of such infections occurring and deaths from these infections occurring around the world, we simply don't know about it. The second challenge is the complexity of the Australian health system. We have, as you know, our federation of states and territories, and this affects our decision making, our funding and our service regulation. And Professor Marilyn Cruikshank, who uh, from the Australian <coughs> Safety and Quality Commission, talked about this at our summit earlier this year. And this affects our capacity to respond to AMR detection and response in a uniform way and in a rapid way across states and territories. As uh, Professor Thursky alluded to, we also have a divide between private and public hospitals. We have a great capacity to capture data and to regulate what happens in pu public hospitals, but in fact, 44% of our care, uh, hospitals are in the private sector. And this has implications not only for how we collect our data, but how we share that data and regulate our response to any concerns and report that. Another concern or, or challenge that we have in tackling AMR is the increase of private laboratory ownership. And this has implications for testing and reporting again and sharing of data. As uh, Kaz Thursky also alluded to, we have a difference in our engagement between hospitals, both from the metropolitan to the rural <laughs> sectors. And this is just, again, participation in the Antibiotic Use and Resistance Australia report in 2016. The third challenge is that this is a very <coughs> complex problem. And as you've heard right throughout our talk, particularly starting with uh, Jody McVernon, that this is not simply a human health issue, but it's an, a, an environmental and animal health issue as well. So the, the four things we have to tackle, weak surveillance not linked to public health action, poor infection and prevention and control, poor use of antimicrobial resistance and lack of research and development affect all of our responses in the healthcare and AMR. As Kaz <coughs> has told you, Professor Thursky has told you, 
Australia is actually internationally recognised for our superb antimicrobial stewardship programs. However, this is largely at the moment hospital based and as she's also said, we're not yet dealing with prescribing in the community, particularly in aged care facilities and primary care. And further beyond that, we certainly are not regulating our prescribing in uh, animal health arenas, either livestock or companion animals. Another important uh, challenge for hospitals is affecting our spread of AMR because this is largely preventable. Australia does very well in this regard in that certainly our control of the built environment, we have modernised many of our hospitals from this old Florence Nightingale to the single bed where possible, where there is a sink available with um, you know, appropriate sorts of hand wash and that can limit the spread of infection. The Hand Hygiene uh, Australia program that was led by uh, Professor Lindsay Grayson from the Austin Hospital and the Doherty and uh, run through the Commission has been very important in this regard. And there are other things that we can do, healthcare staffing ratios and bed occupancy not exceeding capacity and obviously more generally about vaccination to prevent initially viral infections and bacterial superinfection. But again, Within hospitals, the issue is that we have people from our community coming in and out and also from aged care facilities and that we don't fully understand the implications of transmission within and without the walls of a hospital into our community and aged care facilities. And a lot of work is required to answer those questions. You will have heard that the NHMRC MRR Medical Research Future Fund has put out a call in this regard for more work about aged care facility, uh, not only antimicrobial prescribing, but also uh, resistance spread and transmission. Now, this, uh, Professor Thursky has provided this slide, and what's very key, we are moving to an era of data. It fascinates me that, that there are people that know more about the car I drive, the number of children I have, the pets I own, the food I like, compared to my own health. Our ca capacity to collect and share data in the health system is way behind everywhere else or every other sector. And there's very important things such as not only the use of antimicrobials in hospitals but also in the community and in uh, companion and livestock industry and animals and the environment. But in addition to that, that's got to be connected by the very wonderful data we're getting from whole genome sequencing from Ben Howden and other laboratories, both uh, to shed, uh, to um, connect information about uh, resistance patterns as well as antimicrobial use and spread. The issue is that the systems do not talk to each other. We have currently laws that are changing that affect our sharing between jurisdictions across state borders. But also, as uh, alluded to earlier, this is a very expensive resource. And indeed, the very different systems that we're using don't always talk to each other. And finally, I think this should be challenge four, but it's so important that it's four and five, is that our governance of our response to antimicrobial resistance is very complex. Currently, the uh, Commonwealth of Australian Government Healthcare Council oversees our Australian Health Minister Advisory Council, where all our secretaries and departments of health around the country sit. Uh, and that's where a number of jurisdictions related to antimicrobial resistance and use report to. This also interacts with the Australian Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare, and the Minister for Health and the Minister for Agriculture uh, also interact through the Antimicrobial Resistance Prevention and Control Steering Group, and finally, the Australian Strategic and Technical Advisory Group, or ASTAG, that I've recently been invited onto, as has Professor Thursky and Professor Howden. But as you can see, this is very complex. But the key issue is, as uh, Professor Lewin indicated at the start, no one owns antimicrobial resistance. What that means is that we don't have one overarching coordinating body that enables us to have a linked uniform response to AMR detection and action. What that means is also that we have many differences between uh, both our detection of antimicrobial resistance across different states and also an inability to have a uniform public health response. 
And this is what drove me and, and the Society, Australasian Society for Infectious Diseases, together with the Australian Society for Antimicrobials and our vet colleagues, the Australian Veterinary Association, and also the Australian College for Infection Con Prevention and Control, to hold a summit earlier this year at the Doherty, uh, at the WEHI, where we had over 300 key representatives from specialist colleges, from government. We had the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Brendan Murphy, the Chief Vet, um, Dr Mark Ship, as well as other representatives from government, Professor Anne Kelso, CEO of the NHMRC, where we put together a list of key priority actions and timelines that we want delivered. But the two overarching priorities were that we believe that this is such an important issue that COAG should formally designate antimicrobial resistance as a major national human and animal safety issue. And secondly, we need to, as a priority, develop a better cross-jurisdictional capacity to coordinate and manage national AMR control activities. So on that note, I just want to thank all of the people, many of whom are in this room, who helped contribute to that summit and the other people who contributed to my presentations tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jones. I would now like to welcome Professor Christine Kilpatrick, who will chair our panel discussion this evening. Professor Kilpatrick commenced as Chief Executive of Melbourne Health in May 2017. Previous appointments include Chief Executive, the Royal, Children, the Royal Children's Hospital from 2008 to 2017, Executive Director of Medical Services, and Executive Director of the Royal Melbourne Hospital. She trained as a neurologist specializing in epilepsy. She was appointed a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Science in 2015. Professor Kilpatrick has held several external appointments, including Chair of Victorian Quality Council in Healthcare and a member of the Women's and Children's Health Board. She was awarded a Centenary Medal in 2003 and in 2014 was included in the Victorian Honour Roll of Women. Please welcome Professor Christine Kilpatrick. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, so we might ask the panellists to come up onto the stage. We will open up for questions, both from the audience here and also, uh, Nick, you're going to help me with the, our online questions. So I think you'd all agree uh, we've had a marvellous uh, uh, number of talks tonight about the various aspects of, um, of this fascinating, absolutely fascinating topic, beginning with the overview from Sharon um, and particularly emphasis on the global aspects, uh, the epidemiological approach from Jody, um, followed by uh, the use of genomics in tracking the resistant pathogens from Ben, um, and then Karen with a wonderful uh, discussion on the antimicrobial stewardship program, uh, and then finally Cheryl, uh, topping it off with the challenges in the hospital world, which I'm sort of very, very familiar with. So um, I think it is a, a, a wonderful uh, program, well done to the ambassadors for organising this, and it certainly uh, makes us all think about uh, what an extraordinary problem we have and what a very difficult and challenging problem to, to tackle. And so um, perhaps I might just start off, the one thing that strikes me as absolutely extraordinary is the, the science and the facts and the logic are all there. It's not, and the evidence is all there. It's not, in some areas of medicine, it's not, and that's a bit tricky, so we can never, we struggle to get consensus. But here, it's all there, and yet it's the human factors, the culture, as a couple of the, the um, speakers brought up, which are really worse than ever I've seen of anything else when I think about it in health, are getting in the way. And I, I don't really quite know why, but clearly that must be the, the area that we need to really focus on. So I open up to the speakers to say, just to speak about the human factors and where, what I call human factors, culture, whatever words we want to use, but why are we so resistant, so to speak, <laughs> to the obvious change and evidence-based practice we need to, and I'm talking mainly about human uh, treatment here at the moment rather than the animals, which I, is a bit beyond me, but um, so mainly in that space. So, Cheryl, Karen, anyone? So, without talking about the cultural um, 
challenges within, say, prescribing hospitals. I'll defer that to Kaz. I think that in Australia, one of our challenges has been exactly what I said. It's not clear who is responsible or who is accountable for responding for AMR. So part of the, um, the human response is that no one owns that issue. And if you're not uh, given the response, the responsibility of owning that issue, then it becomes in the too hard basket. I also think that it's not seen as it's seen as a, a distant issue. It's seen as, um, you know, when I'm prescribing, say, to this individual patient, you know, really then you're just dealing with. Um, you know, the risk potentially, say, of having a child who may have a bacterial infection, albeit rarely, and so that becomes what's on your mind rather than this distant notion of antimicrobial resistance in the community. I think that antimicrobials are not valued. They're seen as not being worth very much really so if we actually if you put up if we when we listen to our health economists talk and they say well if you suddenly make a course of kev tracks and a thousand dollars it would probably significantly impact who would choose to use particular antibiotics based on costs it's not an issue generally for us in some ways it is but that lack of value of it um, and the ease of which uh, you know, a, a doctor will write up one gram of kevtriaxone without really thinking about the cost, the cost to the patient in terms of potential issues and then the longer term costs. Um, I don't think that's really um, something that has come into um, the culture of thinking and they talk about reflex prescribing, for example. And some of the work that we've started to do, because as a physician, I didn't know much about qualitative research. So now being engaged in that process and understanding why things happen the way they do, it's really interesting. And I have a particular interest in the role of nursing in our healthcare system in hospitals in particular, because and in aged care probably, because our nurses have never been involved much in the stewardship, but actually they're key because they are the coordinators of the care and can actually significantly impact on what that doctor will do when they come on the round. For example, um, Mr Smith's doing really well, actually. He's had a full breakfast. Um, does he really need to have his IV antibiotics continue? Really simple question, but could potentially change. And with our work in the sepsis pathway at the Royal Melbourne, um, engaging the nurses into the program significantly in change what antibiotics we even started because the nurses were part of the decision making that that's not that's not the right um, antibiotic for pneumonia so these are the it's tr this antibiotics everybody's business needs to come into clinical practice for everyone in the hospital and it is not just the domain of the doctor um, I think one issue we haven't t talked about much today at all is around um, community engagement and empowerment. So you can see the panel here, we're all sort of experts in ivory towers and we've got no um, community uh, representation here. And one, um, there are lots of public health, good story, good public health stories where you've got, you know, you're targeting the community about wearing seatbelts, not smoking. Um, to some extent um, with HIV, with the Grim Reaper, where it went community-wide. And another, I think a really good example was perhaps about washing hands. So the big, um, there was this big push around the benefits of hand washing in hospitals. And many hospitals did a um, promotion where they got healthcare workers to sort of um, uh, uh, stand up and you know, sort of empower patients to ask their healthcare workers, have you washed your hands before or disinfected your hands before you've touched me? So I think we haven't really done much on a population level here. We read all these stories about 50% of people that walk into a GP get antibiotics, but you know, we haven't done a whole lot about empowering community and getting them to be the gatekeepers in a way. And we have a very um, well educated, you know, in a country like Australia, we, we could do that. The other thing, just before, as a uh, comment, is I think one of the challenges is it, it's a problem not about the patient in front of you and not even one next door, so patient safety. It do, that doesn't sort of, it's about the future. And I, it seems to me a bit analogous to the environment. And maybe we can learn from how the, the environment, we have captured the minds, the hearts and minds, particularly of a younger generation. Maybe that's what we need to do here. 
So I, I was going to make that exact point that most of what we prescribe in medicine is a side effect in that patient. You know, we're giving them cancer chemotherapy or a beta blocker or whatever. So it's about how that affects that patient. There's not much that we do, although we need to think in a public health sort of perspective around vaccine preventable diseases and that sort of thing. But most of what we do in prescribing does not think about the broader consequences. And so that's a definitely a, a different mindset. And I think that idea that antibiotics are cheap and any clinician uses them in a very... Um, you know, willy nilly sort of way. You know, you you don't use chemotherapy like that. And you know, it's only the you know, it's only the oncologists that get to use chemotherapy. But these agents are just as precious. They just um, don't have necessarily have the toxicity toxicity profile. And the other the only other thing I was going to say is we don't have a GP representative here. I don't know if there are any in the crowd who want to make a comment. But at the summit that we held. Um, you know, the, the point was made that, you know, the, the public do still expect antimicrobials to be prescribed and that the average GP consultation time in Australia is six minutes and you compare that to 22 minutes or something in, uh, in, in Sweden where we're talking about comparing our rates and so things like that, you know, understanding those complex issues is another key point and, you know, I think we need to be aware of that. So let's open up to the audience. Yeah. Do we have any general practitioners here? Please, yes. So I'm a, I'm a GP, so I've got a, a couple of comments to make. First is I think you're a, uh, our patients certainly are very aware that they shouldn't be on antibiotics. So I think the community understanding about trying to avoid antibiotics is in our patient population is quite good. I was wondering, as a GP, for us it is very much about the individual in front of us. And if it's 6.30 on a Friday night and you've got a, an 18-month with a, a mate in, a, or a two-year-old with a temperature of 39 and a sore throat. I'm wondering, is there any research being done on point-of-care testing, for example, because that would be more useful for us, um, because really you can't follow a guideline unless you're confident of your clinical assessment. I'm just wondering where we're up to on that. Thank you. Good point. Does anyone want to um, comment on that? There is a huge amount of interest in point-of-care testing. So the stewardship guidelines in the UK have introduced CRP as one of the recommended tests in in pneumonia but also you would have heard of the longitudinal prize which is a huge piece of work so the, the holy grail is to start to get some sort of magic cheap affordable point of care test that's going to help us decide um, i think there is a great amount of fear about missing a serious infection as you say sitting at, we have heard of children being sent home for emergency with meningitis you know, GPs saying, oh my God, I'm gonna miss something serious. And that's absolutely a valid fear. So that question of sepsis and not sepsis, or incipient sepsis and not sepsis is really important. And if you look at the UK, they've got a major driver around that. Um, and I, and so I, I agree actually with Sharon that there has been not, apart from um, some of the MPS work, um, we haven't had a strong media communication focus and around how we communicate with the public and to support the GPs in what you're actually trying to do. Um, there are, yeah, so, I mean, you might want to talk about some of the tools and things that you have at your, that you have to use, but it's, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> so, we will... I just remind those who are in regional Victoria, offline, uh, online, who are online, uh, if they have questions, please send them through and we'd be delighted to try to answer them. I, I think it's wonderful the efforts that are being made here in Australia, but I was horrified uh, some years ago to uh, visit some small ports in third world countries by yacht to walk into a pharmacy and find that you could just buy prescriptions over the counter, you, you could just buy antibiotics over the counter without prescription. And this uh, occurred on quite a few occasions. And, you know, you, you sort of wonder that the, the wonderful efforts being made here, is this being undone elsewhere in the world? I don't know if anyone sort of has a handle on this sort of thing. I don't necessarily have a handle on that, but having spoken to people who work in those areas, you, you know, you, we we are very fortunate with our medical system here that you know, and some of our rates of resistance are not as high because of these issues that you describe. And so, if you're dealing with countries where there's two patients per bed and no running water, and poor quality antimicrobials, that's a you know, a perfect storm for more resistance. And uh, I think in Australia, one of our greatest threats actually is re recurrent importation. You saw the data from Jody's slide about. Uh, travellers who 
acquire and colonise, so they're unaware, but they're colonised with these drug-resistant pathogens. And we've frequently seen this in the genomics that reveals it, that you know people are constantly importing these things into Australia and we've sort of been bombarded with resistance, particularly from Southeast Asia and some other regions. And, and this human mobility is a huge issue for infectious diseases in general. Um, I think most of the time we are saved by the fact that our sort of simplifying assumption that organisms that are resistant will be less fit is generally true. And so unless those organisms come into an environment where there's going to be that same force of selection that they generally will dwindle, but certainly in the viral world for influenza, for example, um, prior to the 2009 pandemic, a, a strain of um, the H1N1 seasonal influenza emerged that was resistant to oseltamivir, which is an antiviral drug. It wasn't actually um, in the presence of much oseltamivir use and that strain became globally predominant within one year. So these types of resistant organisms, if they do happen to be fit and happen to have resistance, can spread very rapidly and, and our world is highly connected. So this is another dimension of the threat that we need to really be cognizant of. And I think another uh, important driver is this is precisely why the United Nations and the GO8 have, have put this for the first time as a major public health priority so that some of the, um, the capacity building can occur in countries, in low and middle income countries where there is you know, poor use of antibiotics, you know, poor infection control and limited resources. So this, this is a really a global issue. Um, we've done some outreach work with WHO in places like Vietnam, Laos, Mongolia, Philippines, looking at the challenges that low middle income countries face. And it is remarkable when you look at the ratio, the nurse patient ratio in some of the hospitals are 25 patients to one nurse. Um, the clinical pharmacists are almost non-existent. It is not, they're so busy just trying to dispense drugs. Um, infectious diseases specialists, remarkably, are kind of a rare breed still. So um, there, there really is a huge issue about that workforce capacity building. And unbelievably, you know, it, when, in, when I was in Manila, um, e even the most whiz-bang private hospital, they, they don't have a drug chart per se. So the doctors still write the prescription in squibbly writing, then that gets extracted by the pharmacist onto another piece of paper and another piece of paper to go off to get dispensed, another piece of paper. So some of the stuff that we completely take for granted and we have a standardised national drug chart, you know, even the basic building blocks of even doing an antibiotic audit is almost impossible. So the really even starting at the very base, um, not only with the clinical skills to do that and then actually starting to do the work is very difficult. And then that's does not even talking about the lab side where there really is very little um, high quality laboratory capability to even do um, surveillance. So the data that you see out of these countries are clinical assets and it's very skewed. So you don't actually really know what the true situation is. Thank you. Do we have questions? Yes. There's a microphone coming down. Thank you. Uh, I think it was uh, Professor Lewin who uh, reminded us that we probably shouldn't be looking to the pharmaceutical industry for the next get out of jail card in this area, or at least that might not be, uh, you know, the main way to think about it. But in recent times uh, in the public press, I've noticed uh, some groups turning to nature to look for novel approaches in this area. <laughs> Um, such as uh, some particular qualities of selected honeys and I think a Swinburne group has looked at the dragonfly's wings uh, which appear to never get infected. Um, is, you know, this kind of other approach or looking to other avenues in this space uh, valid or was this just journalists on a slow news day looking for a good public interest story? <laughs> Uh, not at all. I thought that um, the dragonfly wing story, which was one of the winners of the Eureka Prize this year, was really, really fascinating about this surface and how it um, evades microbial colonisation. Actually, I said the opposite. I said that it, a lot of people do talk about the pharmaceutical industry not investing in another newer, bigger blockbuster antibody that can kill everything. But I don't think that's the solution here. I think the solutions we're talking about, behavioural change, a, a kind of simple uh, 
using the tools we've got, we can already could have, could have a really big impact without the newer, bigger blockbuster drugs. So I actually think the opposite, though I do think we do we will need more tools in our toolbox, but this is not the solution for antimicrobial resistance. Turning to nature, um, I think, is a really interesting uh, concept. In fact, there's some good stories here that, um, that uh, Ben might talk about some of Tim's work or looking at um, host targeting the host response to a bug rather than targeting the bug might be a clever way to evade resistance. You know, I think there's a number of different strategies, but certainly looking at what's out there, you know, these antimicrobial resistant genes have been present in pathogens for, you know, forever really. And so, the, you know, a lot of other pathogens have a de uh, developed uh, mechanisms to overcome those. And so there's a lot of work um, looking at, you know, compounds that these different soil pathogens, plant pathogens, other things produced to survive in that complex microbial environment, which is sort of giving some new leads for potentially active agents. But it's a, it's a huge lead time from doing that sort of work to getting something to clinical practice, and most of them fail along the way. So I think we have time for another question. Yes, please. More a brief comment, but I, I think one of the behavioural issues that I see in this area is that it doesn't matter which prescriber group you talk to, it's always another prescriber group that's more <laughs> more of a problem in their prescribing than you are. And I think that's made it very easy for everybody to avoid responsibility by pointing the finger to somebody else. Part of the human factors. <laughs> Absolutely. So one, one last question, please. Uh, thank you for a great talk. That was really interesting. I actually sit on the Infection Control Committee at the Austin Hospital as a consumer. So it was really very pertinent to listen to your presentations. I've got a question in relation to, you discussed the um, prescribing pattern in northern, in Scandinavia, and said how much little, or how fewer uh, broad spectrum antibiotics they use. And I was wondering if you could comment on the differences between Scandinavia and Australia. Well, they actually do say that it's a different culture, actually. It is a, not an expectation to get an antibiotic. Um, we had a, a visiting um, steward, <coughs> stewardship expert, Harkin Hamburger, that came out from Sweden to talk about what they did. And, and he reassured us that it took a good 15 years. So he said, look, you're, you're on this, you know, you're halfway there with hospitals, but you've got... So, which is why I put that reality check in, because it's going to take us a bit of time to change that um, behaviour, not, uh, not, not only in the prescribers, but in the, um, in the population. He actually, the, the prescribing has become so low in Sweden that now they're starting to look at the unintended consequences of having such low prescribing. So now they're starting to look at their missing sepsis or mastoiditis. So it really is interesting. And the fascinating thing was that the tools that they had were just a simple pocketbook. There wasn't a complex set of clinical guidelines for urine we use, nitrofurin toin you know, for skin infections used. So it, it, it's, it, it is interesting and, it, and it, it really did come down to different culture. We know from the PBS data there are certain pockets of the population that have very different cultural attitudes in terms of antibiotic expectations. And I guess there's probably the spectrum in prescribers as well. There's a few other interesting um, systems issues, I think, in many Scandinavian countries. How they store population-based data is, is incredible. In a country like Denmark, where you have population-based access to understand disease patterns. And also another strategy was it is in hospitals, and I might be out of date here, but that they used to be very, very vigilant about healthcare workers who might be colonised with resistant organisms, where here we've never done anything like that. So extremely um, prescriptive about who can, about screening healthcare workers and who's able to practise and not, and maybe different approaches to authority in Northern <laughs> Europe, I don't know. That wouldn't work here, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
No, I was going to say, we absolutely, absolutely, we have a very different culture. That's what it all comes down to. So um, I think we, we might finish up there, but uh, maybe we need to go to uh, Scandinavia and they need to come here, and that might give the ideal, uh, the ideal outcome. So um, I think you will agree, had some wonderful talks, and others will thank our speakers in more detail, but uh, I hope you've enjoyed the panel discussion. So please thank our panellists. So I'll now hand over to Hannah Micklejohn. Sorry, just to start off with, there has just been a slight change. I'm not Hannah, for anyone who doesn't know me. <laughs> My name is Tanil Relnick, but thank you all for having me and thank you to our speakers. Um, so I'm a member here of the Student Ambassador Philanthropy Group. Um, this group was initiated in the 150th celebration for the Melbourne Medical School. The vision for this group was to create a student bursary that was entirely run for students and by students. So that, that bursary is um, it's designed to provide emergency funding for, for students in unforeseen circumstances. Um, it was specifically created two years ago, and since then we've been working really hard to try and build and grow this funding. So our fundraising today and over the year is about more than just another worthy cause for people to donate to. It's a token of camaraderie and support. It's a way for students, both past and present, and the broader medical school community to support one another through tough times that can happen to all of us, such as illness, theft, a family emergency, or some other unforeseen circumstance. The purpose of this bursary is to help students overcome practical problems that could otherwise compromise their ability to continue their studies, and secondarily, to have a positive impact on student mental health overall. I'm delighted to be able to tell you all here tonight that our first bursary ever was awarded this July. If anyone here would like to help us to provide this practical emergency assistance, please feel free to donate what you can to our 2017 appeal. All funds donated to this um, bursary will provide student bursaries within the school. You can donate at the link that is supposed to be on this slide, but is um, on the retranslate streaming app, which will have your online programs on it at the moment. Um, so please feel free to donate now or at a convenient time and give what you can to our appeal. Thank you very much. So this does bring us to the close of our symposium for 2017. So just to finish off, I would like to introduce the president of our Student Ambassador Program for 2017, Tel Corrin, to give our thanks to everyone here who made the evening possible. Hi, thank you very much, Tanil. Um, yeah, I think, so there is a link there, but you will all be sent a link later on in the evening, um, in the next few days as well. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that on behalf of the entire ambassador group, I would like to thank you all for coming today, and also for those of you who have been joining us um, online. The uh, live stream was provided using the five stream production, so thank you for them for bringing us together to our um, various campuses across Victoria as well. Um, we're especially grateful for our speakers and panelists who have made this symposium possible. I think you all gave us fantastic and very thought-provoking talks. Um, and for the Peter Doherty Institute for supporting Retranslate today. Um, as a token of appreciation, um, the organizing team has a small gift for each of you. So we're just going to give it to you guys now. Um, so thank you all for thanking me to them today as well. Um, now, before we leave, um, I would like to also um, thank the organizing team for the symposium. Um, Nick Saputro, Thivia Sagaran, Jason Tan, Victor Lin, and Sophie Wan, who invested countless hours in organizing the event today. Um, this is the third year of running Retranslate since its inception, and I think it's only getting better and more exciting every year. So I'm very happy. I think you guys did a really fantastic job. And it was, yeah. And finally, I would like to also thank the head of school um, of the medical school, Professor Jeff McCall, and to the faculty of um, engagement at the office, um, Janice Thomas, Belinda Collins, Kate Nash, and Nathan Ferrotti for supporting this in the, um, initiative as well. So thank you. Help me thank all those people for making this event possible again. Yes, yeah, so I think that is all the thanks we give today. Um, so thank you all for coming, and hopefully we'll see you at the next symposium next year as well. <laughs>